Rich Rob and Rob Bone. Streaming live across the globe, Anjali Rao, Rob McKnight, and David Robinson. And Rob and Rob Bone. Welcome to the Ange, Rob and Robbo Show. Yes, indeed. Welcome to a brand new series of the Ange, Rob and Robbo Show after our three-week break. Well, I'm here. Angeli Rao's here, but Robbo's not here. We've got Joe Casamento filling in for the aforementioned David Robinson tonight. Hello, Joe. Hello. I need to coif my hair, I think. <laughs> what does he usually do? He's, he's got a very a bit of a coif, doesn't he? He does. He does indeed. He Robbo does. and he's not snubbing us. Uh, he's doing an outside broadcast for ABC Sunshine Radio, so ah. we will catch up with him on Wednesday. He will be back. Oh, no, tomorrow. Is he coming back tomorrow or tonight? No- oh. Sorry, Ange? I said he's work shy. That's why he's not here. <laughs> he's idle as. Indeed he is. He doesn't know the meaning of work. No, that's not true at all. Uh, Joe, it's so good to have you as we come well, back thank to you. changes. I have got my own cloak of invisibility. It's true. Watch this. Right? Ooh. Oh, oh, you've never looked better, Rob. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's so tricky. You can pull that out on Halloween. That's so I, tricky. I know. Uh, well, I'm actually on a chroma key screen for this series, uh, that's what how we're doing the show now. So, and there's a little bit of material there, and I discovered right before the show, I can make myself disappear. So I was very, very thrilled. Yeah, we all. I'm are. using all the kids. <laughs> <laughs> I expected more of a reaction, but you two old uh. friends. Um, and <laughs> got to ask before we yes. move on, you've started shooting the Real Housewives of Melbourne. How is it going? Um, I can't tell you that, Rob. (laughs) (laughs) Filming has begun. Production is well underway. (laughs) That is what I can tell you. Ah, fair enough too. (laughs) Look, uh, we are excited that you're doing The Real Housewives of Melbourne and it does mean you won't be here every night during the shoot, but you're... But you're going to be here as often as you can, and for that, we appreciate it. Hey, there's a lot coming up tonight. We've got Sonia Kruger coming up. Uh, This is an interview I've already recorded, and she drops some tea about Big Brother, her relationships, and some secrets about the television industry. So, Joe, I think you'll be very interested in that one. Oh, I love Sonia. She's my girl crush, her and J-Lo, and you, Angelie, of course. Yeah, so well, I'll be excited to hear. Uh, what yeah. I'm third. <laughs> Joe, could you? All equal. All equal. Everything we meant to each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and if all that's equal. not good enough, tomorrow we've got Hamish Blake from Lego Masters on the show. Oh wow! And Wednesday, Sam Mack. You know, they all what? pop by the Andrew and Robbo show. The place to be. Fantastic. All right, let's get into our news uh, topics, our big hot button issues. And if you're on the NDIS and you have noticed your funding going down since it started, well, things are about to get a whole lot worse. The Australian Report's funding for all participants could cost taxpayers $50 billion a year, more than twice the current budgeted $21 billion. The paper also says the original architect of the scheme, of the scheme John Wood, has backed a controversial new independent assessment process which could see plans reduced or even removed from the NDIS without the ability to appeal. And $50 billion a year is a big amount of money. Do we need to accept that we don't have the cash to look after everyone? We don't have the amount of cash to look after everybody at this level. That isn't to say that, um, you know, it's, it's written in blood. It isn't. It, $50 billion a year is a gargantuan figure. Um, and it swamps the original number by a huge factor, which I think can largely be put down to mismanagement and incompetence. And um, don't forget all the people fleecing the system. Um, you know, there was this gang only the other day which allegedly stole $10 million from the NDIS. That was just one four days ago. 
and there have been plenty besides. The thing is that it's it's it really is such a shame because the original intent of the NDIS was befitting of a civilized society, and it was desperately needed. Um, but that it's exploded. That's not a great surprise. To this extent, I think it is. Yeah, it's a, let's yeah, take the money it's, it's away from beyond the pen. It really is. Like five thousand dollars a year because someone stole ten million dollars. You know what? Let's focus on the people getting ten million dollars and somehow getting that out of the system. How the hell do people fleece the NDIS of ten million dollars? Oh, completely. It's it's absolutely been mismanaged. There is a huge level of incompetence. Um, you know, and, and John Walsh, who was the architect of the NDIS, is absolutely right when he says that if the cost carry on like this, there is a very real threat that the federal government might just go enough, throw in the towel altogether, and that would be catastrophic for people with genuine disabilities. Um, look, you know, I, I know that, of course, disability campaigners are pushing back against this new assessment strategy that's been suggested for who should get what, but it is the only way. At the moment, the system is bursting at the seams. Another 100,000 people who are currently eligible are predicted to access it in the next two years, that can't be allowed to happen. And the only way is a new assessment criteria that I can see. Yeah, but the new assessment criteria, Joe, are really just about getting people off the scheme. Shouldn't we just say, you know, like $50 billion, I know it sounds like a lot of money, but let's not build, I don't know, uh, let's just not build something we were going to build let's this is people desperate uh, yes, uh, for, for yeah. a few people it, fleecing the system there are a lot of people in need here and anyone who's used the ndis knows that no matter what you say to them your budget each and every time is reduced they don't care what yeah, you yeah look i I have to say the costs are probably more because there is a lot of unknown uh, with disability within our community and I think more and more people come forward requesting assistance and care and we as a community I think need to acknowledge that. I was fortunate enough last week uh, to go out and see the Wind Gap Foundation which is my local uh, group which started with four mums, can you believe it, who had intellectually disabled uh kids that weren't uh, didn't fit into the normal schoolwork it's now grown to nine homes for for independent living um and they do sports programs they help get these uh uh, people that need assistance into work. It's the most incredible, amazing uh, place that does all these incredible things. And we're having a gala next week to raise more funds. And I think the message I got from them was that more needs for integration within businesses, within the councils, within the schools, within the community, where we can, you know, get Harvey Norman to help uh, retrain uh, at some of these people to get work to you know there needs to be more inclusion in workplaces to provide training and employment and all those opportunities to increase their financial independence uh, of those able to work with a disability because it's a huge spectrum as well i mean a lot of these wonderful 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 people i met are so capable much far more capable than i am at many certain jobs and um, it's a shame that they aren't able to work because they want to be able to work and that would take pressure off the NDIS system. Well, and that's why it needs a new assessment strategy, don't you think, Joe? I mean, you know, it wasn't that long ago that the NDIS was only going to cost $7 billion a year and it was paid for by just a little tiny rise in the Medicare levy. Then it was $14 billion, Then it was $21 billion, And now it's $15 billion. You can't see that facing it starts with the way that people are assessed. Because we have not, the government has not been aware of the real issues out there. And for the first time in a long time, and only because of the money involved, the government is suddenly going, wow, there's a lot of Australians out there suffering. So what's their plan? Oh, we're going to take the NDIS. We'll threaten to take it away. Mm. The problem with this new assessment mm. model is that it's not someone that's been following your progress, who you've been working with, or yeah. it's independent, independent. Whenever they say independent, yes. they mean paid for by the government, government. or the government. So they're yeah. not looking out for you. They're looking out for the government. And you can't challenge your assessment. Currently with the NDIS, if you don't like what what's being put in front of you and with your budget, you can actually challenge it. Well, under this new system, you can't. You don't like it, 
Too bad. That's not a great system. I just think we need to realise what the issues are and allocate the full resources. This mental health and disability in this country is the biggest issue we're not talking about. And it's about time we started focusing time, resources and money onto the real issue out there in the suburbs. Not all the crap that people think are the issues, that politicians think are the issues, but the real issues facing ordinary Australians. Anyway. Couldn't have said it better. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Because a plane full of passengers has been forced into a 14-day lockdown in Brisbane after a virgin plane missed a strict deadline to enter the state to avoid having to isolate. Nine News has more. The flight was scheduled to depart Perth at 1.40 on Friday afternoon, Australian Western Standard Time. Around the same time, a three-day lockdown was imposed. Due to aircraft maintenance issues, passengers weren't able to board the flight until 7.20pm, a delay of six hours. I personally checked the Queensland Government website prior to getting on the plane and it said you just had to self-isolate for three days. But when the plane touched down in Brisbane at 1.20 in the morning, local time the next day... I turned my phone on and checked and saw um, one of the news updates was that um, anyone arriving after midnight Australian Eastern Standard Time would be required to go to hotel quarantine. The Queensland government changed border requirements while the flight was still in the air. Nine News understands Virgin was made aware of this but didn't relay the information until the plane touched down and here's where it becomes even more baffling when passengers disembarked here at Brisbane Airport. Greater Perth hadn't even entered its three-day lockdown. There was still 40 minutes until the lockdown actually commenced in Perth. Frankly, I wouldn't have boarded the plane. I would have stayed in Perth and locked there for three days. Well, since then, there have been no new cases and Premier Mark McGowan has announced an end to the lockdown at midnight tonight. So, Ange, what do you make of these passengers being forced into quarantine? I think... Uh... It, it's so wrong on so many levels, but then on the other hand, what else was going to happen at this you know, particular point in time? It's not you know, like logic comes into any of it. Um, I, I just don't see it ever happening any other way. Um, it doesn't matter whether you know, Virgin decided to fall on their sword and say, oh God, you know, it was all our fault. This was the only way that it would have happened. And I'm surprised this is the first one, to be honest. Um, I don't think it will be the last. Um, it's just, logic doesn't come into any of it. It's just, you know, we can't operate at the moment on a case-by-case -case basis, um, seemingly. It has to be this blanket um, arrangement. Yeah. You know it's a it, hard it's, line, Joe, when it comes to COVID mm -hmm. and border lockdowns and all this kind of stuff. But I've got to say, when you're on a plane and can't make changes to your schedule and it's mm -hmm. an arbitrary lockdown, you know, like if, if it's a real issue, the moment you find out there's been a case, lock everything down. But we don't do that. People still in Perth were running to other areas to avoid the lockdown. You know, because it was happening at midnight tonight, everyone had noticed. I do think you've got to look here and say, this plane of people, there is no difference if they had landed an hour or 20 earlier as opposed to being delayed. We've got to use common sense, of course. Here, don't we? There isn't. Look, uh, I, of course we have to use common sense, but I think there's always going to be someone caught out, someone where you've got to draw a line, don't you? Sure. And so, you I know, agree. yes, the decision was made me there. Uh, that was unfortunate. I think anyone that takes a flight currently is taking some sort of risk of, of not getting to their destination, being, you know, we, we all know what's going on. Australia's doing very well, as we know, because we are being incredibly overly cautious. And that's working for us. God. If you look at the news with India and everywhere else, a far main load of people be put out for two weeks, then the rest of us, you know, not do as well as we have been doing. So this lot of people, for me, were just a bunch of whingers. You took the flight, you knew the risk. No, uh, you didn't know the risk. That's the point. <laughs> Sorry. There, wasn't, the point. there wasn't a risk. The guy <laughs> even said that he checked the Queensland website and the Queensland border came into effect before the Perth lockdown. Like... Yeah, you know, I'm 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 a rule follower. They first for their me. hotel, they didn't look at that to pay. I would have been, you know, on their side, but they got reimbursed. Sorry. 
Wow. Wow. And I thought I was the hard ass when You're it came to Casamento. Casamento. Wow. Oh my God. Joe oh, Casamento. Oh, wow. Okay, if you've ever wanted to be anyway, one of the first... Final words. <laughs> That's all I could say. Hey, look, if you've ever wanted to be one of the first people on Mars, Elon Musk has an important warning for you. Take a look. Um, it's a long journey. You might not, you know, come back alive. Um, but it's a glorious adventure and uh, it'll be amazing, an, an amazing experience. And your name will go in history. Yes, you might die. <laughs> and it's going to be uncomfortable and uh, you probably won't have good food and uh, all these things, you know. <laughs> so so yeah. if, 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 if an arduous and dangerous journey w where you may not come back alive. <laughs> yes, you heard about the SpaceX pioneer made this blunt <laughs> prediction about the race to Mars in a new interview. It comes after Musk predicted in December that his company would have humans on Mars by 2026. Joe, would you be open to risking your life for a Mars adventure? Well, well two things. One, that is the funniest thing I've ever seen. Who would in their right mind actually risk that if you were actually genuinely interested in it in the first place? But for me, I just can't see the interest. I have no fascination. Oh, I do it. I, I can't even watch TV show. Would you? Yeah. There'd be no <laughs> shopping malls there. Any, like, anything to get away shopping from my home. kids. That's Seriously. Not... No. <laughs> no, no. If I That's was great. a 20-something single man <laughs> with the opportunity mm. to be one of the first people on Mars, I would ta I would do it. I would 100%. You might be a single man after that last comment, Rob. No, I think she'd come with me to Mars and leave the kids here. <laughs> we'll leave them with Abby, the producer. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll buy you a ticket for Father's Day. Well, you, it's like, do you know, those flights to go up, you know, where you just literally go up into space and come straight back down, they're like a couple of hundred thousand dollars. I'll take $250,000, $300,000. I'll tell you right now. If I had that kind of money, I would be doing that. I would literally go on one of those and I'd happily be one of the first people. It would be amazing. I, I feel like I'm in the minority here. I'd send you there. Yeah, <laughs> and? Oh, no, you just said she'd send me there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, you know, listening to Elon Musk actually admit it that, you know, people are going to cock it. But it's of course. Like deaths? <laughs> what? Matt Damon lived on Mars for centuries. At least that yes, kind of felt like a god awful pile of poo. Um, seriously, oh. but you know what? I like the is that somebody wouldn't assume that um, people would die. Of course, people died all the time. You know, sailing to unknown lands hundreds of years ago, or you know, the early days of right. flight, or you know, all those people trying to break land speed records. Um, you know, pushing new boundaries means that you will maybe snuff it. Yep. Um, but also, Joe, from what, what you said about, um, you know, who the hell would do that? So there's this global mission to Mars. And the last time I checked, there were over 40 Aussies who had signed up to it. And that's to colonize Mars. And it's, that's a one-way trip. There ain't no going home for Aunt Bertha's 90th. You take that wow. trip, you take your life in your hands. Um, would I do it? Not unless every single person on this planet had severely pissed me off, but, you know, it's housewives, so that might happen. <laughs> Let's wait till the end of the season. Sorry, I need to jump in. Abby, can you go back to that feedback from, feedback from Claire Dixon? Um, or would it be like Mars in Total Recall where they had shopping malls and the first thing I thought oh, of, yeah. oh, the three-breasted woman. The three boobs. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the kind of shopping I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Oh, oh, no, no I, I'd totally be up for it. I, I, I really, I genuinely would love that. I just think it'd be amazing. And yes, of course, there's a risk of death. You know, what's life? Life. Who are the celebrities that have signed up for it? Because I think is it Tom who signed up for it, and a few of them have actually, Victoria you know, tried Principal. to already. Victoria, oh, Victoria really? was Principal. the first person to sign up and I think will be oh. the first person to do it. Um, someone might, like Abby, want to fact check that for me. But um, I do believe that it was Victoria Principal that uh, was going to be the first official like person on the first flight. Yeah. 
Yeah, but to be honest, what on earth has she got going on down here anyway? <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't That's this a look like a great stuff. place for a new home. <laughs> There you go, Joe. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I, just, I just don't see the appeal. I mean, I yeah. can go out to my backyard and see that. No, I do not believe your backyard looks like that. <laughs> no, it's it's been done. Actually, I have actually, I've actually landscaped it. It yeah, did yeah. look like that though a few weeks ago. Oh, go to my okay. Instagram and check it out, Rob. Go and check ah, it out. At Joe Garden Makeover. <laughs> That's it. On Instagram. Page. Whenever I go to your Instagram, I don't see any landscaping pics. I, I see um, amazing Abby, outfit Abby, you need pics. to pull it up. No, there's me gardening. I love the way. Abby, do this, Abby. Do this. <laughs> oh, hi, hi. me planting Mondo grass, hand planting individually one by one, test tube stock. <laughs> they even know what it's called. Well, well done, Joe. All right, we'll look Thank forward you. to renovation, Joe, in the coming weeks as part of the Ange, Rob and Robbo show. Hey, moving on, and Queensland's bid for the 2032 Olympics just got a little bit stronger, with the federal government announcing it will go halves with the state government. The Courier Mail reports the Prime Minister emphasised his support for the bid, highlighting how all levels of politics need to come together to help it get across the line. Uh, Joe, does anyone still care about the Olympics? Oh, this actually warmed my heart, this story. I still have such great memories of Sydney 2000. Um, it just brought the whole city together. And I actually do think people will care. I think I'm not a sportswoman, but I know through my kids, nothing unites people like sport. And um, I actually do think it will bring a great amount of tourism. I think it will bring a genuine buzz. And I think the fact that the, you know, Mo ScoMo and Anna are working together is actually quite, quite a, a lovely thing. You're in Queensland, wouldn't you go? I would. I, I actually, um, one of my biggest regrets is I was living in Sydney during the Sydney Olympics and I actually didn't go to any events, but I did go to the live sites. Yeah, I don't know what I was thinking. But... Um, uh, I Oh, Kathy, run! I mean, they meant I saw Tatiana pole vault. I, I just, I have such <laughs> great memories. I don't think Truly. anything will ever be as special to Australians as the Sydney 2000 Olympics. Um, not even for the people of Brisbane and the Gold Coast. But it would be nice to have. I think people are more a bit like now. Is it worth the hassle? What do we get? Uh, about one of the mm -hmm. only. Cities, is, you correct me if I'm wrong here, Ange. Really, it's only Homebush that has actually made something of their Olympic venue side, haven't they, of all the cities around the world? Oh, God. As, as far as I can tell, I mean, look, I, um, I just find it all a bit grotesque these days. It's sort of like, oh, billions of bucks to watch, you know, my performance enhancing drug masking is better than your performance enhance, enhancing drug masking. Um, you know... But uh, you oh, know, but we can't take care of the elderly. And... We, oh. well, yeah, I live in the world. Um, you know, we can't take the the care care of the elderly in our care homes. We can't. Uh, you know, back to our top story about to spend fifty billion bucks a year on the NDIS. It's like for God's sake. You know, we've all seen the wastage around the world from Olympic host cities. Um, and, you know, I, I was, um, you know, CNN's only anchor sent to cover the Beijing Olympics back in 2008. And sure, it looked all bright and sparkly for two weeks. You know, never mind all the homeless people who disappeared off the streets and all the villagers that were, you know, raced, raised to the ground to make way for whatever looked the part. And now there's huge structures that were built for countless, countless dollars are all sitting there rotting for nothing sure. um yeah. but look you know i loved watching the olympics as a kid i really did um but that's when the, there was literally nothing else to do now we've got you know wall-to-wall -wall sport on a thousand different channels um plus are we not sick of watching all these you know despotic regimes or bankrupt countries being given the honor of hosting the games the only olympics seriously that i find it even vaguely entertaining and i do find it very entertaining is the eskimo olympics have you seen that oh my god competitive ear pulling that's gold right there <laughs> surely you mean inuit olympics no, it's I have never called called looked the, at that. No, no, the World Eskimo no. Indian Olympics. That's wow. what it's called. Okay. Yeah, don't try and Inuit me, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hey, look, I knew one thing, one thing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, there is still You just so- popped my balloon on that. You did just pop my balloon on that, Ange, didn't you? I was all excited. What, Don't the let her waver your After excitement, all, Joe. Together. Oh, my God. Get used to it. So cynical. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. I'm a professional balloon <laughs> popper. Hey, look, there is so much still to come on the Ange Robin Robbo Show. Sonia Kruger is just around the corner for the interview where the tea will be spilt. Oh, yeah, watch out for that one. And we'll also get the latest entertainment news with Joe tonight. But now it's over to Ange for the latest news headlines. It certainly is. Let's see if I remember how to do it after three weeks away. So here are the stories making news on this Monday, the 26th of April, 2021. Candles lit up the night sky as a Queensland community held a vigil for a mother of three who was allegedly set on fire and killed by her estranged husband. 27-year-old Kelly Wilkinson died last week in the backyard of her home in an area known to be quiet and family-oriented. Her former partner, Brian L. Johnson, is facing murder and other charges while Queensland police are to undergo an internal review into the events that led up to Wilkinson's death. Her children are now being cared for by her sister, who has five children of her own. A ban on all flights from India could be put in place within days after a raft of options Australia is considering in response to India's worsening COVID situation. Discussions are underway on temporarily halting flights out of India, which would prevent thousands of Aussies, including cricketers in the Indian Premier League, from getting home. Australia will also likely send oxygen, ventilators and personal protective equipment to India as part of an immediate support package. That's as India's infection rate has soared by more than 2 million over the past week to the highest levels of any country in a seven-day period. Australia's most decorated soldier has taken leave from his role as general manager of Channel 7 Queensland amid a scandal involving his alleged conduct in Afghanistan. The network says Ben Robert Smith was always planning to take time off to focus on his legal matters as he's suing Channel 9 over a series of stories he claims paints him as a war criminal. Seven says Robert Smith's absence has nothing to do with today's front page story in which he shredded the Australian Defence Force's disgusting treatment of veterans and staggering lack of direction. And Commonwealth Bank says its online services are up and running again after being down for four hours today. Customers complained they weren't able to do their online banking this morning, with many saying they couldn't even access their credit and debit cards. Commonwealth Bank said the issue also affected contactless payment in shops and it has apologised for the outage. We're getting a check for you of tomorrow's weather right now. A shower or two for Cairns and 29. Mostly sunny in Brisbane and 25. Hazy in Sydney and 23. Morning mist and fog for Canberra and 20. A morning shower or two for Melbourne and 17. Mostly sunny for Hobart with high of 19. Sunny in Adelaide and 22. Partly cloudy in Perth and 27. Sunny in Alice Springs hitting 26. And a shower or two for Darwin. A top temp of 33. Now it's back over to RMK. Thank you, Ange. Well, long-term viewers of this show know how much we love Big Brother and tonight saw the welcome return of the reality TV show. Sonia Kruger is, of course, the host of the show and she joins me now. Hello, Sonia. Welcome to the Ange Robin Robbo Show. I, thank you for having me. This is very cool. I love your backdrop. <laughs> the, uh, yes, thank you very much. Hey, you are one of the hardest working people on TV. You host Big Brother, Holy Moly, The Voice, Dancing with the Stars, the upcoming Big Brother VIP. That's a lot of TV. And I've got to be honest, I'm a little bit worried about you, Sonia. So tonight we are going to send you a care package to make sure you can get through the year. So we have Amazing. some chocolate just for that little bit of a hit. We yes. have some Red Bull. We have a can of V to keep you going. Okay, uh, we have we have coffee. It might be a bit cool when by the time it gets to you, but just warm it up in the microwave. <laughs> I um, don't know if you want me with all that caffeine in my system. <laughs> I know the feeling. We have a donut. What have we got? Yeah, I may have had a bit. Um, okay. And the all-important no-dose. So this care package... <laughs> I haven't seen that since university. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I could tell you a story. My farewell when I went to university, I took 
too many of these and too oh. much alcohol and no. ended up in hospital. But that's that's enough about me. You were very awake drunk. <laughs> sure. Very, very true. But you are doing a lot of TV. How are you finding I, I, it since you've I gone back to say seven? One thing, Rob. You know so, when you say because a lot of people have said this to me lately about being a really busy person working in television. And I actually, I don't feel that because I sort of see the other side of the coin, like people who work in news and breakfast TV and, you know, they're the people who are the hardest working people yeah. in television. You know what that's like. It's 24 seven. You never get any downtime. Uh, I see it with my partner, Craig. So I feel like I have it kind of easy. In well, it's all about life. perception in this business, Sonia. And, you know, you've done, the, you've done the five day a week on a morning TV show, which is a big slog. That's a big slog. But, uh, but you still, on prime time, have a very big presence. And, and speaking of such things, Big Brother returned tonight, and I have to say, this year the show has really found its feet. Are you happy with the way the show has evolved? So happy, so happy. I, I actually binge-watched, like, 12 episodes last weekend because I couldn't <laughs> wait to go to air, and I was literally hiding in another room with my headphones on. It's so addictive, and there's so much that I don't get to see. I'm there, obviously, for most of the challenges and the evictions, but there, there's all that nuanced sort of relationship mm. stuff going on inside the house that that when, I, when you see those episodes crafted and put together so beautifully and there's they're so rapid paced you know you're you're kind of hooked from the start to the end i just think that they're you know it's it's an incredible job that they've done at shine to, to put these episodes together well i would certainly agree with that and they've learned the lessons from last year last year was good but I felt it missed some of the heart. We have the heart back. And, and I think about, I already have my favourites, and that's the comedy pairing of Denny and Nick because it's second oh, yes. to none. Tell me yes. about that relationship. The Wet Bandits. Or oh, is that what you're calling them? I love that. They actually call, start calling themselves the Wet Bandits from Home Alone. But you actually called them the Laurel and Hardy of television, didn't you? I did. I absolutely did. And I thought that was a really good description because Nick is this tall, gangly, um, Aussie, colourblind house painter, which is bizarre and funny. <laughs> and he makes friends with Danny, who is, you know, your quint essential real estate agent who's always doing deals you yes. know and they're just an unlikely odd couple and <laughs> but together they they have such a great uh, a great dynamic I, I really can't explain how funny these guys are i genuinely expected them to have a big falling out and their relationship they embrace the fact they're so different. And there's just lines like when Nick the tour guy says, oh, I'm, I'm really starting to get into this game. And Danny says, well, about time. We've only been here for like three weeks. <laughs> yes. And and Danny's really funny because he'll he'll make moves that he thinks are smart and everybody kind of thinks, oh, yeah, that's a good move. And then Nick will turn around and say to him, that was the dumbest thing you've ever done. Yeah. And I can't tell you what's coming up after tonight. Obviously, I don't want to spoil the surprise for anybody but there there is just so much that happens between them between other members of the house the power shifts constantly constantly and constantly every episode it's like mm. who who's going to have the power who's going to be in control tonight you know who you think is it's Big Brother? Well, it is Big Brother. He has the ultimate power. Sure. But within the housemates, they're always jockeying because they need to have the numbers on their side when it comes to an eviction. Absolutely. Now, I'm going to ask you, who is your favourite housemate this year? Oh, I can't, well, you know. No, you've got to give me a name. I'm not going to accept favorite. they're all great in their own way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I tell you what, when Danny first started, I actually thought, oh, no, you're, he's going to be really polarising. Yep. But 
in actual fact, you, you kind of, my relationship with the housemates changes throughout the series yes. because you get to know them. And it's like having this whole, meeting a whole group of new people and you get to know them, they become your friends. And some of your friends, you know, at times you love them and at other times they annoy you. So yeah. it's kind of like that. My feelings towards all of them change. I, I actually said that in the review I did because I found exactly the same thing that someone I like one day, I'll really dislike them the following day, then I'll like them again. So you really, it's like a real relationship. Um, but I've got to ask you, how much do you invest in the shows you're working on? A lot. Well, it's hard for me. I think if, if you're not invested, how can the viewer be invested, you know? Yes. And I, I'm lucky that I, I've been given the opportunity to work on these incredible shows. And something like Big Brother, for example, you know, really I become so drawn into it. As I said to you, you know, I, I've been calling Amelia Fisk, who's the executive producer, saying, please, can you send me a few more episodes, you know, because I want to see what's going to come next even though i know so it's it's yeah I, look i guess dancing with stars i've always been passionate about it when they called and said they were doing an all-stars version i i just thought wow that i never expected rob N never expected it in a million years that's the other thing i think but well, you thought it was dead and buried oh no no i just didn't i just wasn't in my on my radar that seven would be doing it it's yeah. pretty much the same deal with the voice when i left nine to go to seven um the the hardest thing for me to leave was the voice because it's the hottest ticket in town it's the sexiest show on yeah. tv who walks away from that you know but uh, you know there were other opportunities at seven and it's just that you know that point in your career where you go i need to change things up and shake it up so i, I never ever expected seven to to also now have the voice it's well, just the way uh, uh, people wouldn't have seen this, but there was a sales presentation um, uh, uh, that concerned The Voice, and it literally had you there saying, and where is The Voice? Whichever network I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you like that joke. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. You know, and speaking of that, you've had a long and successful career. I first worked with you back on Today Tonight in the year 2000 when you were an entertainment God. reporter, and now you are one of Channel 7's biggest stars. How does that feel? Uh, I, I feel very lucky. You Look know, at that there's... girl. Did you oh see it? My gosh, that <laughs> scary. I'm going to replay um, that footage. Can you? <laughs> Actually, I, I want you to see that again. Look at this. Look at this girl, Sonia. Sonia Kruger here with a. That looks like my mother. <laughs> Twenty years ago, <laughs> uh, you know what? I've been the thing I think that has really helped me, Rob, and you would attest to this as well. You know, working on Today Tonight and working on programs, you know, way back when I first started on Wonder World, you'd have to go out, you'd have to shoot it, you'd have to script mm. it, you'd have to, you know, do a paper cut and then sit in an editing booth and, and edit it with, you know, with the editor. You'd have to choose the music. You had total control over that piece of television that you yes. that was eventually going to go to air and that's where you learn to appreciate the skills that certain people bring to their jobs you know there are great writers out there there are great editors there are great executive producers you know there are there are so many moving parts to making a, a, a fabulous piece of tv and i think that's the thing i have respect a lot of respect for all mm. of those people and i've been lucky to work with some of the greatest in the industry so you know I, oh, look it was a pleasure that. working with you too <laughs> <laughs> we always got out we always got each other's sense of humor there's no <laughs> 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 now, speaking of today, tonight, you found love with someone I greatly admire, and that's your partner, Craig. Was it difficult having a relationship in the workplace? Well, we didn't have a relationship in the workplace. Yes. And he was awful. <laughs> he was <laughs> can we so talk about this? Because you two oh. didn't get on. I, can, no. I, can I be honest? When I yeah. found out that you two were an item, I did this. What? 
<laughs> so, so how it transpired really was that um, when I worked for Craig, he's he's one of the toughest taskmasters there is. You know, you would know, you get very little praise from Craig, but you will definitely hear about it if you've made a mistake or you you've missed something. His praise so- was if he let you come back in the office the following day. Exactly. <laughs> so I remember having a fight with Craig. I was at, filing a story. I was in New York doing uh, a story with Jennifer Hawkins and Donald Trump, of all people. Oh, and yes. I was filing this story at three o'clock in the morning. And for some reason, a current affair had wind of the fact that we were there doing this story. So they had been Fordham there, kind of chasing, everyone was chasing each other in those days. Yes. Trying to it was the fun and games. Yes, and so for some reason this is filtered back to Craig and I was on the phone and he said something to me along the lines of, well, why don't you feed it straight to Channel 9, Sonia? And at that point, <laughs> I hung up the phone. <laughs> so anyway, fast forward many years later and I had left today tonight. I was working on Dancing with the Stars and my dad was very ill and was in, in sort of a critical con- condition in hospital and I got a text message from Craig. He'd obviously heard about it and he sent me a very kind message and so from that point we'd sort of started talking and and we we reconnected so it was really after i'd finished working with him that that our relationship started and it's 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 strange because we're polar opposites too yes you know? i'm very showbiz and he's very new so but i like to think we complement each other oh absolutely like n- he's i see gonna it hate now him, by the uh, way sorry he's gonna he's gonna hate oh yeah this. Yeah, but he'll call me. He'll have a go at me. It'll be fine. It'll it'll yeah. get us on the phone, so it'll be fine. Because well, uh, <laughs> I, I genuinely do like him, and and Craig and I, and you would know this during on, in the Today Tonight years, he wouldn't have what they call anything on the shelf, so they didn't have the stories. We would literally sit in his office for three hours trying to write the promo, which the team at Today Tonight would go and shoot the story for. I'd come out and say to Nicola, she'd say, "What's the story?" and I'd, I'd hand of the promise you go right i've got to get these elements and they'd have to yes. come and shoot a pro- yeah. story for the following yeah. night but that's the beauty of tv isn't it it's it's a crazy crazy business and, and I, I feel like some of that some of that joy of television is possibly not there anymore i think people like you keep the crazy in there but it's certainly not the way it used to. i mean that in the nicest possible way i'm the no, cra- I'm, I'm much crazier exactly than you Sonia. Mean. yeah I, I, and i think um I, th- I know what you mean in terms of, you know, there's that live factor, which, uh, you know, a lot of live television is now being pre-recorded. So it's like you've got to try and maintain uh, a-, a live quality to it. Yeah. So for me and the shows that I work on, you know, we shoot them as live and the way they're being edited now um, is is to keep that live element in there because you want that danger and that, as you say, that craziness. You, people, I think, they don't care whether it's perfect. I think they like to actually see it when it goes a little bit off the rails absolutely you know it's you can't look away it's sort of like is this supposed to be happening probably (laughs) not you know absolutely i i i love your sense of adventure and and speaking of that i was worried oh hello what have we got oh is that teddy (laughs) That's Teddy. So just one <laughs> passing, I thought for anybody watching, they might want to see Teddy. She is our one-year-old Cavoodle, COVID puppy. A COVID? Oh. And she's chewing my shoes. Is this instead of having another baby, Sonia? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> Unless, of that's course, there's an announcement you want to make. The Daily Mail are watching. <laughs> I'm sure they've got a bazillion headlines out of this <laughs> Hey, look, I I love you so much. You know that I'm a big fan of yours, always have been from the very early days we worked together. Big Brother launched earlier tonight on Channel 7, but you can catch up at 7plus.com.au and there's a brand new episode tomorrow night at 7.30 on Channel 7. And if you want one-liners, just watch those evictions and listen to Sonia. Sonia, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you, Rob. And thanks for being such a great supporter of the show. I know you guys are really passionate about it and and, and that means a lot to me. It really does. Oh, Sonia, you're very, very welcome. Thanks for being on the Andrew Robert and Robbo Show. Well. It's the Red Life Shot of the Day. Where are you going today? You never know where you'll end up with the Red Life Shot of the Day. And today we're taking you to the London Underground as this channel streams 24-7 point-of-view journeys throughout the lockdown. 
When the city is not in lockdown, an average of 2.7 million tube journeys are made every single day. Now, let's get into some feedback after we take a notice of the temperature there, which I missed. But anyway, the ladies are here to keep Rob in line. Never has a truer word been spoken. Beck says, love all your guests. I really love them too. Carlotta, hello, Carol. Hi, beautiful Joe, miss you. Better sort than Robbo. Oh, I didn't do the Carlotta voice. Hi, beautiful Joe, miss you. Better sort than Robbo. Ah, Carlotta. <laughs> <laughs> She'll love that. Um, Dravis says, Joe on Entertainment 2 wasn't three weeks off enough for Jason and Robbo. Yeah, tell me about it. Nicole says, wanted to get all the goss on maps from Jason. He did a sneaky in the last couple of weeks, caused a bit of trouble. He did indeed. We will be talking to him about that tomorrow night when he returns to the show. Uh, MVP. Oh Sorry, Joan. Oh, I can't. I, can you do a whole episode, please? I oh. need to understand. Uh, well, Joe, tune in tomorrow. We might make a whole entertainment oh. report a debrief on maths with Jason. Oh, uh, 100%. <laughs> he was the series. He really he, was. He the was series, the star. He, he was the star. He was. MVP Madsen says, Sonia Shaw is one of the busiest women on Australian television at the moment. That's certainly true. And Mary says, totally missed everyone these last few weeks. And look, Mary has done a fabulous birthday video. Our one year anniversary was last week. Mary, I'm going to play it tomorrow when Robbo's here so that we can all enjoy it. So, and I, it's not that I forgot, Mary, and that seeing your name has just reminded me. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Joe! <laughs> it's time for Eat of Entertainment, and Joe Casamento is here. Alan, what is a good day as our movie reviewer? You are, of course, our movie queen, and earlier today, Joe, Australian time, the Oscars took place. Take us through the fashion everyone has been talking about. Oh, Rob, it's my favourite day of the year. It is a guilt-free day on the lounge for me. It's about the only day where I don't feel guilty for sitting there for three hours devouring every bit of Hollywood. And while it was one with a difference, the red carpet is back. Yay. The biggest award show in Hollywood has now, of course, come and gone. But it was different with only 170 people attending rather than the usual 3,000. But they still managed to bring out some of the biggest stars and biggest A-listers who hit that red carpet. A lot of people were talking about Carey Mulligan's dress. I loved this. This was a gold Logie in itself. She, gold Logie? Did I just say Logie? <laughs> oh my, my God. Slightly different. Oh my, Slightly I was like, different. Be, oh, my God. Or Oscar. Oh. A gold Oscar statuette. She was wearing Valentino and, of course, she was nominated but didn't win for Best Actress in Promising Young Woman. She uh, topped a lot of best dress lists, though. Then we have Leslie Odom Jr. He was wearing a Brino suit crafted with silk plated in 24 karat gold. Gold was definitely the colour of the night. A suit very fitting for the Oscars, yes. Um, I don't know if we actually got a photo, but there was also a guy with a gold Crocs. They were pretty special too. Um, the next we have here is a man, Seafried. Yeah, gold Crocs. Was wearing a custom Armani Privé and was one of quite a few ladies wearing red on the night, uh, including Reese Witherspoon, Angela Bassett as well, and Olivia Colman. They all look stunning. Sasha Baron Cohen and his Aussie wife, Isla Fisher, were watching from a very special screening in Sydney. Uh, they had the Harbour Bridge behind them, which was rather nice. Sorry, what's going on with about... Isla there? She doesn't look... Ha Something looks wrong there. She looks miserable. Yeah. Oh, they've caught her at an off moment because certainly when they crossed to her She's during the screening... She's literally posing for the camera, Joe. <laughs> She's looking down the barrel. Well, maybe they're just a bit... Yeah. Maybe they didn't say three to one cheese. The most, the most yeah. Most maybe, maybe dress in Oscar's history. That's why. <laughs> oh, out your hard end. You are so harsh. <laughs> they look happy, so though. They did look happy. Well, they're the 
<laughs> I've got to say, I have seen her look better at the school pickup gate. She goes, her kids are at the school just at Bondi Junction. Anyway, look, he didn't win either, but he was in Ralph Lauren and she was in Dior. Um, mm-hmm. And finally, our very own gorgeous Margot Robbie here at Chanel sporting a new hairstyle. This is going to be the new bob, I predict. Yeah, this is going to be the new look. Uh, Halle Berry was sporting the bob as well. And uh, Margot didn't work on her either. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, she looked a little bit... (laughs) I I didn't think her makeup worked, uh, Halle. But uh, Margot looks stunning. She's topped a lot of best dress lists. So, yes, a lot of red carpet glamour. And I, for one, was excited to see people out of their pyjamas on the lounge. I mean, seriously, how many more award ceremonies can we do on Zoom? Uh, Well, we can do it right here. Like, seriously, if you want a real awards ceremony on (laughs) crosses, we can certainly handle that. But, Joe, I've got to say, did you like the ceremony? I thought it was – there were some nice things about it. Like, we got to learn a little bit of each uh, nominee at times. I just thought it was terrible, though. Look, it was a long three hours. I think it even went over the Mm. three hours. Look, I was happy to see the Oscars back because I love film and I have seen most of the films and most of the performances nominated. But I can see for many who haven't seen those films, uh, there wasn't a lot there. There were a few special moments. Um, I, I did like some of the intimacy. It felt a bit like that Hollywood glamour of where in the you know early days of the Academy Awards they sat around in booths and drank and there was a little bit of a... Sort of, you know, there was a sing-along at one point, a bit of a trivia, but it did certainly lose the pomp and ceremony of the Oscars. There were a few nice moments, though, when the uh, the Best Supporting Actress won for Minari and she was so excited to see Brad Pitt, who actually, by the way, was a producer on Minari, but she hadn't met him while shooting and she was kind of so overwhelmed. She was like, where were you? I haven't met you before. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was kind of... That was and she also said, she's 72 or something, and she held up the Oscar and she said... Uh, I would like to thank my two sons who made me go out and work. Here, this is proof <laughs> that I work with. <laughs> I do. And, but, you know, there can always be good moments like that. But, you know, they yeah. moved I, um, Best Picture and lost, uh, you know, and ended on a low note because they expected something better to happen. I, I just thought, you know what, we can all do an intimate uh awards event the big thing about the oscars is the pomp and ceremony and the bigness of it and i think the idea of shying away from that is wrong and what we need to get back to is having a host having someone to run the night that can do jokes uh up but you know like you you'll never get any better than billy crystal the things he would do during an oscars ceremony and i know i'm sounding old here but what he would do during an oscars ceremony was he keep you'd have through lines you know, like he would take an event early on and keep referring to it and making it bigger and bigger. And so at the end of the night, he'd do one last joke on it and he'd get the biggest laugh. But anyway, enough about that. No, 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 but I think you're right. And we did a whole podcast on it tonight, which you can catch. It will be on your podcast tomorrow on TV Binge Box. We did discuss the Oscars. But um, I did ask the question, are we just not allowed to be funny anymore? It's just too ris- uh, risky, is it? They just of can't. course we're not. Of course we're not allowed no to be funny say anymore, no. do. So it's such a shame. You're right. The song and dance of Billy Crystal. Even Hugh Jackman used to do that. And and I know Kevin Hart was cancelled yeah. a few years ago. And it just really, since then, I guess, has lost. I, I'd say the ratings are going to be pretty dismal. Uh, but I do think a large part of that is because people haven't been to the cinema this year, particularly in the US. Frances McDormand, who won the Best Actress, did say, uh, you know, just if you can, get to the cinema, sit shoulder to shoulder, and I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, Immerse yourself back in what it's like to be in a film theatre and reward the industry, and hopefully it will be, we will be rewarded if we do, because uh, then they will start releasing some of these big hits. But that's how long it's been. It's like you just called it a film theatre. It's a cinema. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say that I'll, even, I'll even make it worth a theatre <laughs> A film theatre I do love watching movies at home But anyway, quickly We've got a lot of other entertainment Take us through the winners Oh, okay, alright So, Anthony Hopkins Who I predicted, I told you about on this very show His performance on In the Father here actually took home the Oscar for Best Actor. As you mentioned, uh, they flipped the script and actually held it off to make it the final award of the night. Um, 
And I believe they did that because I think they genuinely thought they would get a heartstring violin moment by awarding Chadwick Boseman mm. the finale Oscar of right. the night and have his wife up on stage. Yeah, it really did fail because not only did Anthony Hopkins win, but he was a no-show. So <laughs> it kind of just ended on this, you know. Oh, like I'm sorry, that's bad producing. Well, but it kind of heartened me. It did hearten me that they don't know clearly the winners. The so at least you know it's not rigged. You should know who wins to be able to make a call. If you're going to be really? the best pitcher, you should know the results so that uh, you can. Definitely. You There's can make no excuse. And how many years? So it, 93 years they've been running best picture at the end moment. So if you're yes, going to change it, make sure it's going to pay off. That's right. Anyway, he actually uh, tweeted from Wales where he was visiting his father's grave. So that's where Anthony was. But <laughs> I I'm not at the Oscars. And I'm at my father's grave. I couldn't go tomorrow or the day after. I had to go on the night of the Oscars. That's how much the Oscars means to me. Why doesn't he just get his two Oscars and we on them. Like, seriously, come on. It's like, no, it's, it's like that old sort of, you know, that, that sort of saying, you know, sorry, I'm late. I didn't want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably 4 a.m. in the morning or something. Give him a break. He couldn't get to the, I don't know, British set that they were all gathered at. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, hey, I will... how old is Anthony Hopkins? If it's late, early in the morning, he's up having a wee anyway. He'll be, he could have got up. <laughs> <laughs> His performance <gasps> is obviously, though. It was a sublime performance, so I'm going to give it to him for that. But um, the other big winner of the night was, of course, Nomad Land, and that was no surprise at all. At least Anthony was a surprise. Uh, Chloe yeah. Zhao won for Best Director. She's only, this is historic, the only, only the second female to ever win the Best Director Award and the first woman of colour. I've asked you this one before. Let's see how good your memory is, Rob. Who was the first director to win? First female. So that's your homeless. That no. You don't know that bit oh, of trivia, do you? Uh, uh, Catherine Bigelow. Had the same thing, right? No. It was. Barbara Streisand. <laughs> Did I Barbara win? Say, but I didn't say Kath oh. I thought Barbara Streisand. And then when you said Catherine Bigelow, I actually thought, didn't she win for um, Zero Dark like, Thirty? Down. No, Zero Dark Thirty, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. We'll have to look up our history there. Anyway, Francis McDormand won the best uh, Bring back our five dollar quiz based on that. <laughs> yeah, that brilliant, brilliant performance. Francis McDormand won the, for the best actress. She did the shortest speech of the night at the end, and the film won best picture. So no surprises there. So overall, a fairly bland event. You're right. Yeah. Oh, depressing. Well, I think we need to sort of take things up a notch because uh, it all feels a bit flat. Um, and let's talk about Sophie Monk's engagement party. Um, well, is it the, the, the longest engagement ever feels like it, but amazingly, well, things I, got a bit loose. I feel like uh, Sophie's been the longest courted person in the history of the world, hasn't she? I feel like her singles have been celebrated for a very long time. Uh, she's, of course, a good friend of Jackie O and the whole Kyle and Jackie mm. o, o show and team. And it sounds like intern Pete got up to some mischief. Let's take a look. The night went off without a hitch. However, one particular guest raised eyebrows after an alleged nude incident. That's Peter. Uh, Henderson's kiss colleague, that's you, Jackie's kiss yeah. colleague, and renowned prankster Pete Depler, known as intern Pete, shared a photo on Instagram which appeared to show him nude in Sophie Monk's house up near her Bardot memorabilia. <laughs> What were you doing? Were you on her lounge, those lovely white lounges? Yeah, it was the white lounge. Like, I was clean and everything. I thought, oh, this should be a good photo shoot. You know, when you have a few drinks and you're like, oh. <laughs> Me naked in somebody <laughs> else's home. I've never oh, thought of that so ever. so bad, so bad. I don't get invited to a lot of things anymore, but... Um... <laughs> That's let's, right. have, let's have a look at the photos. Yeah. Oh, yeah, my oh, God, he's whole like like holes out. Silly nude, more just, like, jokey nude. Do you know what I mean? Like, not, not like, oh, I'm nude. No, Is yeah. It, like nude? Well, now you're fully nude there. Yeah, well, don't seem to oh, look, I'm flicking through. Oh, it looks like a proper engagement party. Yeah, it is a proper it's engagement not some party. Dirty ass, bloody. It's not just a house party. It was a proper engagement party. Wow. Oh, I think I'd be mortified if someone was on my white lounge with their dirty. Ooh. Anyway, I'm sure you've all had a moment at an A-lister party. 
Am I right, Rob? And? <laughs> no! No? Oh, Not well, one like that. it depends how much I've had to drink, but it doesn't take much for me to strip off, so you know. But I don't do it in the exactly. privacy of a theatre. I do it in front of everyone. <laughs> Of a film theatre. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. And are you behaving on Housewives? Do you have to monitor your drinking? I actually really need to know this. I know you can't talk about Housewives, but do you? Do they keep pouring your drinks? That's the bit that I always think is where it goes pear-shaped for Housewives, and I have been watching them for many, many years. Watch your drink. Uh, you know what they say that um, is, you know, the, like mistake 101 of live broadcast uh, is dead air. And I'm afraid that's all you're going to get. Oh. Oh. Hey, oh, Joe, God. we she are running so out of time, but the crowd oh. is obviously hugely yeah. popular. In fact, you'd think any actor would kill to be part what? of it, but it seems there's one role that is proving difficult to cast. Yes, I know. You would think anyone would absolutely do anything to get a role in this if you're an actor or an actress, but apparently the casting directors are having trouble finding anyone wanting to play Prince Andrew. Uh, it comes after his Newsnight interview. <laughs> Any surprises here? About his links to Jeffrey Epstein and stepping down from the royal family. It appears no one wants to be tarnished with that brush, um, that so much so that the uh, producers have taken to Spotlight, which is an online job website for out-of-work actors, to advertise the role. A casting source has said Prince Andrew is one of the most unpopular members of the royal family and wannabe stars aren't exactly queuing up to play him. It's not the sexiest role and it's unlikely to set a Hollywood career alight. However, a spokesperson for The Crown has denied this and swung back saying there is absolutely no struggle to cast any role for season five of The Crown and it is normal practice for productions to advertise in Spotlight. So I guess only time will tell, however. Uh, Tom Byrne, who played him in season four, um, I don't know if you saw that performance, he was only about 20 when he portrayed him, uh, which is the most recent, recent season. Even he said he had to sort of switch that part of his brain off and not engage with his own personal feelings about Prince Andrew to actually play him. So we will have to wait and see if anyone steps up to the role and hey, what Joe, effect it has on their career. Hmm. Joe, the trailer has come out for a reimagining of a classic. Mm. Uh, this is one that I am very excited about. Steven Spielberg is behind the latest remake of West Side Story, Starring Ansley Elgort, Ansel, sorry, Elgort, who was in Baby Driver and The Fault in Our Stars. Uh, let's have a look at this trailer. And by the way, it's 10 year anniversary of West Side Story. Oh. Hmm. Sorry, I said a faux pas before. I said 10 year anniversary. I meant 60 year anniversary. I was going to say, I, I got a little <laughs> bit too like, like, 10 years? Okay. <laughs> 60 years, 60 years uh, since the original West Side Story was released. That music, though, doesn't it just take you back? 
No. Of course, it's thing. beautiful. I remember seeing it, um, you know, at the West End when I was 11 years old and oh. just being completely enthralled. Oh, the West End. That sounds so much more glamorous. I was going to say, I think I saw it at the local... Uh, yeah, I saw it at the Parramatta Theatre. <laughs> Slightly different. Uh, but, yes, one to look forward to. Indeed, Joe. It's been a pleasure having, having, you, having you here tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and you'll be back throughout the week, I believe. I well, will. You'll be here I'll on Thursday, Thursday at the very least. Yes, <laughs> and I'm tuning in to find out all the maths goss. I will be digging you must out drill Jason him. Rose's you must tomorrow night. Him. Angela, it's yes. good to see you again. We will see you Wednesday. You are filming tomorrow. Is that a Don't spoiler? Me. Are we allowed to say that? Uh, no, you are not. Uh, well, everyone, we'll just keep that quiet. <laughs> All right, everybody, have a great night. Goodbye. Hamish Blake is here tomorrow. We'll see you tomorrow on the Andrew Rob and Robbo Show. See Andrew from the